This presentation is called Color Field Painting. Um, it's part of our Light Europe and America's content. We're in 20th century art, and we've just followed abstract expressionism. So let's define color field painting. Um, color field painting was a movement or a school of painters um, that was definitely in line with the abstract expressionists, um, especially in regard to kind of finding new ways to put paint on a canvas, but they definitely were in search of a calmer, more subtle um, effect, and they were really looking towards um, moving away from this kind of aggressive um, way to apply paint, aggressive looking finished pieces of art, and aggressive feeling um, paintings. Um, they were moving more towards um, a clear surface and an entire gestalt. A gestalt um, is a vocabulary word that's introduced here in this movement. And I feel that gestalt is kind of another way to talk about a composition. Really, a gestalt is a German word, and all that it means is that the, the sum of all the parts are kind of coming together and how do they come together. Um, so it has a lot to do with uh, unity in art, has a lot to do with composition. So I feel like gestalt is another way to say that. This movement um, was an, another New York movement. We really um, get to focus on America and New York during this late 20th century um, time period where they really kind of take over um, the innovative movements that then become these international movements. So there's been quite a shift here lately um, from influence coming and starting in America and um, instead of starting in Europe and bleeding over into the Americas. Um, so with that being said, we're still in this, you know, hot New York area with these New York painters. And it kind of started in the 40s, but the color field painting became um, more popular in the 60s. Um, so like I said before, it relies on being very subtle and very calm. Um, what I have over here on the right are some examples of abstract expressionism um, so that you can remember how aggressive and how bold these paintings look and feel. Um, the mark making is extremely intense. Um, it's very um, bold and confident. Um, remember too, it's hard to see from images, but these paintings are extremely layered, um, especially the woman series by William de Kooning. Um, very, very layered. And what that means is there's also a texture to the painting, which we cannot see. So that kind of adds to the aggression a little bit, because if you think about these paint marks that become raised and textured, they're almost kind of like scars is how they appear. Um, and so that just kind of adds to this really intense look. Um, so color field painters wanted to um, still work with this kind of mark making and work with really strong color, but take it out of um, mark making, turn it into more kind of these subtle organic shapes and um, some tonal changes in the paint that are more kind of um, transient from one tone to another. It, it's kind of like a calmness between the dark values and the light values. And instead of this bold, striking, um, you know, change from dark blue to a vibrant yellow, um, they were looking for variations of um, monochromatic hues. You know, they wanted to get the entire value scale in there. And that made it, that's what made it feel a little bit more subtle um, and discreet. Um, the movement places way less um, emphasis on gesture, and that's what I meant by mark making here in these abstract expressionists. It's almost as if you can picture the artist making every single mark or line um, on the canvas because 
it's really emphasized on that gesture. It's really emphasized on the movement that the artist makes, um, those hard brush strokes and the action that came, you know, to make that mark. Um, and so they wanted to have less emphasis on that. And they wanted to have more focus on kind of form and process. So in color field painting, color is also the focus. Um, it really is a study of color and the avant-gardeness of this movement is really freeing color um, from its objective context. And what that means is, you know, when, you, when color has to become an object or become something recognizable, for example, if we put a bunch of kind of blue dots onto a canvas, right, our brain wants to interpret that and perhaps we're going to interpret that as rain. Um, color field painters really want the viewers and part of their philosophy is that color doesn't have to become something recognizable, that the paintings can be just about color themselves. So here are some examples of some artists that um, dabbled in this color field painting and some, um, some examples of color field painting. Um, Mark Rothko over here, I feel was one of the leaders and one of the most well-known color field painters um, because a lot of his paintings, you, you don't have the opportunity to see anything but color and tonal changes. And that is it. Um, the way that he put his compositions or gestalt together, it really did free you. It, it did not allow your, your brain to go anywhere to a recognizable place. Um, it was extremely calming and soothing. Um, a lot of his gestalts or compositions look just like this one and they are quite often monochromatic. Um, so you'll see a lot of paintings like this in reds and yellows, um, where you have your dark values, and then you have some medium tones, and then you have some lighter tones. And the colors are very subtle, and they're very soft, um, opposed to the abstract expressionists. This artist, Hans Hoffmann, um, kind of the same thing, uh, he would, work with a lot of shapes, mostly geometric shapes. Um, but I need you to see that the transition here is way more calm and subtle than abstract expressionists, um, that the mark making is not so intense. There are lots of layers here, but they're more subtle in their tonal values. So if you look at all the greens in the background, you have your yellow greens, your dark greens, your medium greens, and the transitions between them are a little bit more subtle. Um, he does have some different colors involved with shapes, but it definitely doesn't feel aggressive or kind of in your face like abstract expressionists. Um, down here we have Ronnie Landfield who worked more with a watered down paint, sometimes watercolor, sometimes a watered down acrylic paint, and allowed a lot of the colors to kind of bleed together and mix together on their own, which allowed not only tonal changes from darks to lights, but the colors to kind of overlap and mix on their own. And again, just creating these large, soft areas of color. Um, you also then have your color field painters who work uh, a lot more precise. And again, they're working with applications of colors and um, placement of colors. Um, oftentimes you'll see them, you know, with shapes and stripes, but it's very controlled. So here we have crisp, clean lines. And what this almost feels more like is a design, um, opposed to like the Hans Hoffman, where it really just, it feels like a painting. This feels like a design, but don't be fooled. It is a painting, it is a, on canvas. But the point here is color. The point here is that the artist creates kind of this palette of these colors that they choose, you know, and they feel work well together. They invoke interest, they invoke a, a feeling, um, and 
the kind of vertical and horizontal stripings with the cleanness of it also is what brings upon the, the calmness of the painting. Here's another one, Morris Lewis. It's not as precise as Jack Bush, but again, just this repetition of kind of falling stripes, it that's very calming. Um, your mark making is still there, but it's controlled. It's not all over the place. It's not heavily layered, so you don't have textures, you don't have raised areas, you don't have like a scarification look. Um, and working with colors that bring about the, their own feeling of order and calmness. And then down here we have Helen Frankenthaler, who um, this is an example kind of of putting together almost an abstract composition. But then you can see, you know, she has a color palette that she's chosen and her application of color is um, just kind of uh, allowed to do what it wants to do, to fade out where it wants to fade out, to overlap with other colors where that happens naturally. And in the end, it winds up just being about these kind of larger areas of colors. She is actually our image organizer for this um, unit. And so this is image 149 in your book. It is titled The Bay and it's by Helen Frankenthaler. This is acrylic paint on canvas. It's from 1963 and it is large. It is about six, it's over six feet, like maybe six and a half feet um, and almost a squared painting. So um, imagine, you know, this is a large painting and when you're standing in front of it, it definitely has a different effect than if this was, you know, a painting that was six inches by six inches. So um, size is very important when you are thinking about the effect that it has on the viewer. So up here, the content is um, very minimalistic. We have um, variations of blue tones within an organic shape we have um, this blue shape hovering over a flat green area that is diagonally um, divided. Um, and then you have an off white or cream, um, what reads as negative space behind it. Um, for form, you have many values of blues um, that show some contrast. So you have these really deep indigo areas that almost look like midnight black. Um, and then you have these light sky blue areas and you can see the natural transition between them. That's what gives it some calmness. That's what takes away that mark making from abstract expressionists. Um, you have an analogous color scheme. So analogous means that they are, the colors that are chosen are colors that are um, next door neighbors to each other on the color wheel. And so here we have an analogous color scheme because we have blues and we have greens and um, some blue greens happening within this green area. So that's an analogous color scheme. Um, we've already talked about the diagonal. So it's a diagonal compositional arrangement or a diagonal kind of gestalt. The organic blue form definitely feels like it's in the foreground and it feels like it's hovering. Um, you have a neutral background. Um, this is a green wash and it's flat. So flat means that there are no um, heavy variations from dark to light. So this blue area, we would never call that flat. There are just way too many variations of this blue. But in the green, even though you can pick out some spots, right, of light, light areas or dark areas, overall, um, it feels kind of like the same green tone. So we call that a flat wash. Um, down here at the bottom, we do have um, a one kind of more neutral green, more like an olive green stripe at the bottom. Um, and then the composition is pretty asymmetrical, meaning a lot of the visual weight feels like it's not quite equally dispersed amongst the entire canvas. 
Okay, so moving on to context, what we have here is um, the blurring of the blue. Um, the blue covers give, colors gives an immediate sense of the artist's process. So because we can see this fading from dark to light, it kind of gives us a little window into the artist's process, which is important. And um, just like those abstract expressionists, we are still looking at these New York painters who are inventing different ways of getting paint onto a canvas. That is super important for this time period. It's part of that action painting that we talked about. So what Helen would do is she would kind of water down her tempera paint and she would pour it onto the canvas um, while it was still wet. So you have this wet canvas and when you wet the canvas, just think about fabric or a washcloth or something, right? When you have a dry washcloth, um, it it's ready, it's like a sponge, it's ready to absorb water. But when that sponge or that washcloth is wet and you add water to it, it's already full. It can't be absorbed. So water kind of sits on top of the surface. So the same here, when this canvas is wet and then you add more wetness to it, it kind of pools and it sits onto the surface and, and then it takes longer to absorb and to dry. So that's what she would do. She would pool paint here and then when it finally dries, it would naturally be left with these transitions of darks and lights. Okay. Um, so the title makes us wonder, you know, is, is its subject matter um, what the title suggests? Is this a suggestive title? And again, this was important for color field painters because it wasn't always about being a recognizable object. So it's important not to get caught up with the possible um, biography of the painting, but only to focus about what's before us, um, the physical elements of the work itself, because color field artists believe that, that those elements can tell us so much more about the painting. So um, it was a challenge to kind of free yourself. Um, and, and that's what a lot of non-objective um, artwork can do for you, is it frees your mind of something always having to be something else um, and learning how to appreciate um, shape just for being shape or learning how to appreciate the transitions from dark blue to light blue. And that's it. Just learn how to appreciate that in and among itself. Um, this painting was chosen as one of the paintings um, for the American Pavilion of the 1966 Venice by, um, by Biennale. And we're gonna be um, introduced to another artist who was part of that important event. Okay, the medium here. Um, so we talked about this was acrylic paint and um, acrylic paint is kind of a flat paint. It doesn't have like um, oil paint. It Oil paint has quite a vibrant, smooth look where acrylic paint is a little bit um, duller and, but acrylic paint is really versatile. So you can make acrylic paint extremely thick and almost like an impasto where you have a very textured paint, but you can also water it down and make it very, very thin, like a watercolor paint. So um, that's kind of the joy of working with acrylic is you can be really versatile with it. Um, so again, we already talked about this, but part of the medium is also part of her technique. Um, and so, you know, as a substitute for the action painting, you know, with the dripping of the paint from the brush or from a stick like Jackson Pollock, um, what she would do is she would lift her canvas. And remember, this is six feet by six feet, you know, so she's walking around the canvas, lifting one corner at a time and tilting it at various angles. So the paint would kind of flow around the surface. Um, she had to account for gravity um, and kind of the flow of the liquid across this surface. Um, and so her method um, is the blend of, you know, an artist who can control exactly what she's trying to paint 
um, but also there's some unpredictability with the end result. And that's kind of a nice marriage that she puts together with her paintings. Um, the innovation and the change for this artwork is that it's definitely a less aggressive style of abstract expressionist. Um, and then the subject matter is also non-objective. We talked about non-objective with abstract expressionist because it's really where it was born. You got to see, um, even though our abstract expressionist image, um, Woman One by William de Kooning, is still uh, representational. We can tell it's a woman. We can see the, you know, the abstraction of that form. But we also looked at a lot of abstract expressionist paintings that were non-objective. And that's really where that was born. So now we're continuing on with this non-objective painting. But I feel like color field painting embraced it more. Abstract expressionists, I feel like it wound up being non-objective, but that wasn't the intent. The intent was this action painting, right? How to be a physical painter, how to, you know, paint when you take the brush out of your hand, what else, what other techniques can we invent? Um, but this now is a little bit more philosophical. Um, we still are using some action painting, but but it is a challenge now to um, take away recognizable objects and just allow these shapes and this color to be what it is, and that's it. Um, the theme of this could be abstract painting. The function is merely for viewing. That was the motivation of the artist, was to create artwork that was pleasurable to a viewer, um, and it was just meant to um, be displayed and viewed. And then for the comparison, I compared it to um, Ogata Corinne, our, wet, our white and red um, plum blossoms from our Japanese unit. And the reason why I chose this one is because of the technique. Um, so for Ogata Corinne, um, this technique was um, the Terashikomi technique, where um, same thing, they, um, he applied paint onto an already wet surface which allowed some of those red blossoms to be kind of soft and have their edges bleed out a little bit um, and not be so you know, kind of crisp. And so because we're working on wet surfaces here and applying you know, paint to a wet surface, I thought that that would be a good comparison. Okay, so in summary here, um, just a small little paragraph when you first see a cubist or impressionist picture, right, there's a whole way of instructing your um, the eye or the subconscious. So what you're what you're doing with these paintings and in these movements is you're taking dabs of color that had to stand for real things. So think about those those impressionist paintings, um, or think about you know Van Gogh's Starry Night, where ultimately he's just taking color and making these marks with it. But each color is placed so strategically and each color is chosen st so strategically that they wind up making a recognizable image. Color stands for something recognizable. It stands for real things, okay? Um, so the opposite is going on now in color field painting. If you have bands of blue, green, and pink, the mind doesn't have to think sky, grass, and flesh, right? So these are colors, and the question is, what are they doing with themselves and with each other? That's it. Um, so sentiment and nuance are totally being squeezed out. Color field painters really were almost advocates for color itself and not taking their paintings and turning it into something recognizable and something that you can, um, you know, give meaning to, that it was a challenge to enjoy the color just for being color.